My name is Logan Gilmore, and I am going to be presenting Locating Cephalometric X-ray Landmarks with Foveated Pyramid Attention. So we're going to jump right into the problem here. This is a uh, lateral cephalometric X-ray where we can see that there's these 19 landmarks have been labeled onto this image. They're used for diagnostic purposes for orthodontic surgeries and stuff like this, um, but we're just going to be focusing on finding the landmarks themselves. So this data set has 400 images in it, and it's been labeled by two different medical doctors. And we're gonna see if we can learn how to label these landmarks. So one of the best existing methods uses two different scales of random forest regression using HAR features. And uh, a more recent method uh, is a convolutional approach uses two scales of UNET. So this is already kind of suggesting a multi-resolution approach might work well. Uh, makes sense because the images are 2,400 by 1935 pixels. So CNNs were originally inspired by human vision. Here's some historical approaches. But for big images, we sort of see how they're not exactly like human vision because with a really large image, if you try and, you know, like the size we're working with, if you try and put that directly into a convolutional neural network, a vanilla network, uh, you're gonna run out of memory. So the, the key difference between how uh, current convolutional neural networks work and how mammalian vision works that, that is the source of this problem is that where convolutional neural networks sample uniformly from the image, mammalian vision has been shown to have a, a roughly log polar sampling density that's centered on the fovea. So that's wherever your gaze is currently directed. So on this slide, you can see some examples of, of approaches that do uh, log polar sampling or fovea centered sampling of some kind. And this is a thing that you can actually apply a convolutional neural network to, even with this log polar mapping. But the problem is that this is uh, no longer gonna be translation invariant. You can imagine the, the actual images are very warped towards the center once they've been mapped out onto a pixel grid. Uh, this isn't a huge problem necessarily, except uh, we should no longer really hope for our transfer learning to work uh, since the domain is so different. So what we're going to do instead is use image pyramids. Image pyramids give us sort of both things at once. They give us the, the really high density sampling of the original image, and they give us uh, a lower sampling level as you go higher and higher up into the pyramid. But wait, you say, <laughs> that's more pixels, not less. Yeah, so typically uh, because you're, you're making the amount of pixels you have to process higher. Typically they're only used at inference time or some people there's like feature pyramid networks that construct them incidentally along with the features. So anyway, what we're actually gonna do is just throw most of those pixels away. We're gonna take a 64 by 64 patch from each uh, level of the pyramid centered on wherever we're currently focused. Uh, we're going to use some kind of iterative method to decide where to focus. But the notable thing here is that if we use a fixed number of iterations, then the problem scales with the log of the side length of the image rather than the square of the side length of the image, which is a huge improvement and makes much larger images possible. So here's the, the proposed method. Our goal here is we're, we're trying to figure out where that ground truth red dot is in the, in the figure on the slide. And so we're gonna make a Gaussian pyramid from the image. And then we're gonna take a column from the image pyramid centered on our initialization. Here, we just have it as the center of the image. And we're gonna try and predict where that red dot is. And so uh, the CNN will process all these different levels of the pyramid. You'll see that at the top level, the lowest resolution, the red dots inside of it. So we probably can have a good chance of knowing where the landmark is at that level. And at, by the time we get to the highest resolution, it's actually not currently in view. So that level probably won't contribute much to the process. So then we're gonna take all of the outputs from these CNNs, we're gonna put them together somehow. We're gonna speed them into a neural network and we're gonna predict a location. So then now that we have this new predicted landmark location, then we're just gonna iterate this process again. So we've got this gray predicted dot and uh, we're gonna take a new column, the uh, set of dashed gray patches, um, which you can now see is much closer to the ground truth landmark, the red dot we're trying to find. And then we're gonna make a new prediction because more levels of the pyramid can actually see the red dot within the, the column of patches now, the glimpse. Um, we should be able to make a better prediction. So then we just iterate this process 10 times and take whatever the final prediction is. So there's some existing literature out there that, that does something like this, uh, specifically recurrent models of visual attention. 
um, uses a similar column taken from what looks to be an image pyramid and they use an iterative process moving their focus point around the image. Um, what they're doing is more complicated in some ways than what we're doing because they, uh, they're using a recurrent neural network that's taking into account past glimpses, back propagating through time, all of that stuff. And an additional major difference is that uh, they're directly processing those pixels with the recurrent neural network. Whereas we're gonna process these things with a convolutional neural network to hopefully be a little bit closer to human vision. Okay, so now we'll kind of break down the uh, individual pieces of this process a little further. So the, the first thing is the creation of the image pyramid. It's a Gaussian pyramid. It's down sampled by a factor of two at each level. Uh, again, the patches, the gray there are 64 by 64 pixel patches. And there should be enough levels in the pyramid that the top level of the pyramid encapsulates basically the whole image. So it's sufficiently down sampled that 64 by 64 is enough to see the whole thing. So for a visualization of what this looks like to the CNN, um, you can have a look at this figure. Uh, the red point here is the the lower incisor landmark, and you can see that near the landmark, we have really high resolution. And then as we sample further and further from the landmark location, uh, we can see that there's lower and lower resolution as we step up levels in the pyramid. Okay, so next we're gonna figure out what the CNN's gonna look like. So one of our inspirations was uh, Trident Networks. Uh, specifically what they do for object detection is that they simultaneously process inputs uh, at three different effective resolutions, uh, though they use dilated convolutions rather than an image pyramid to do that. So our approach hopefully has a little bit less aliasing than this. Uh, and the way they do this is they just use the same kind of a CNN you would use for one level, and then they uh, run three different instances in parallel, which is sort of equivalent to, do a, to doing kind of a weight sharing. So our CNN is a ResNet 34. It's pre-trained on ImageNet. Uh, it's got the final three basic blocks removed, as well as the fully connected layer. And so this is going to remove a couple of down samples. And then we also reduce the stride of the input layer. So that effectively removes another down sample. So for a 64 by 64 patch input now, the resulting activation is gonna be uh, 256 by eight by eight volume. So again, you can see there's four instances of the CNN in this uh, figure. They all share weights. So it's, it's really just showing that we're processing each patch in the column with the same CNN simultaneously via vectorization. The reason we're using these big activation volumes is so that we can take methods developed in the pose detection literature uh, for regression of joints, like human joints and images. What they found there is that it's actually more accurate to reformulate the problem as predicting a heat map of, of most likely joint locations and then taking the maximum value pixel and treating that as your location within the original image uh, rather than just having a linear layer at the end of the convolutional network predict a coordinate. Particularly, we're interested in integral human pose regression which reformulates that taking the maximum valued pixel in the heat map as instead taking the expectation of those values, uh, which effectively reformulates it as a center of mass type calculation. This has a couple benefits. One, it's differentiable, which is going to be important. And additionally, it means that you can get away with quite a bit smaller heat maps because each pixel is sort of taken into account for that final regression calculation. So what we're trying to do though is a little bit more complicated because we have all these different levels of the pyramid that we wanna treat as sort of one cohesive foveated image. So if we just do like an integral regression at each level of the pyramid and average them, we're not really allowing for the sort of rich relationship across scales that we would hope for in, in something a little bit more cohesive that really takes advantage of the representation we're building. So if you've ever seen a visualization of the activations of later layers of convolutional neural networks, you'll sort of see that they learn to find these fairly high level features. You could kind of interpret the activations as a heat map. And so the insight here is what if we regress the locations of these arbitrarily found intermediate features rather than the location of the landmark we're actually trying to regress and then use these features what we call spatialized features to then combine all the different resolutions together 
and regress the actual landmark location. So you can see here, we're taking this activation volume in and the, the two little cutouts are sort of little pretend versions of what you might see inside of one of these activations. So one of the one of the eight by eight little patches from this volume sort of shows a feature that's strongly localized by the convolution neural, neural, neural network and it has a location that we can point to here. So we can use integral regression to convert this this eight by eight raw activation uh, into a probability distribution via softmax and then find the expected value of its activation. And so we can do this for each of the 256 eight by eight activations and then concatenate all of these locations of these features that we've found, uh, that we've learned to find into a big feature vector. You could also imagine though, like if you see the second cut out there, where there's really not much activation at all, probably the feature it's expecting to see is not present, um, you would want some way for the network to be able to indicate this. So the reason that we've got three vectors instead of just a, a two-dimensional coordinate is that the final value is the expectation of the raw activations. So you can kind of think of this as, as a softmax pool because we're weighting the original raw activations by the resulting probability distribution we derive from them. So we're gonna end up with an average of the activation weighted towards the highest activations. So the assumption that this kind of forces the ConvNet to deal with is that each of its activations then at its output represents a feature that can be kind of localized and described by its center of mass plus one number indicating how present that feature is. Uh, so we can kind of look at uh, some visualizations of features that it learns overlaid on top of the image. So each quadrant here is a different feature. The red dot is the landmark, the cella. That's the landmark that we were learning to localize. So the first thing you can notice is that it's, it's not just learning to localize the average position of the cella with every feature and sort of average them all together. It's, it's sort of actually learning something more useful. So in the left-hand side there, you can see the, uh, the, the top of the two rows of images. It's sort of learning to find this point uh, kind of at the back of the teeth. And then in the lower row, it's, it's learning to localize this point sort of tucked into the eye socket. On the right-hand side, we have a higher resolution patch. It's, it's closer to the, uh, the native image re resolution. And one of them is sort of finding a blob that seems to fit to the cella there. But then the other is sort of finding some point on that contour. So you can kind of see that it learned how to find these, these useful points uh, so that later on, once we feed this into the next part of the network, these, these small like shrunk down three vectors describe something useful. Okay, so now we're just gonna step back to the big picture. Um, a quick note, uh, we've been talking about four levels. That's what we've got in the slides here. Actually in the implementation, there are six levels. It's just easier to fit four levels on the slide, makes a better diagram. So talking about six levels, we've got six sets of 256 three vectors. And so we're gonna take all of those things and we're gonna flatten them into one great big 4,608 vector. And then we're gonna push that through a standard multi-layer perceptron. So that MLP has all ReLU activations. It uh, takes us to a 512 vector, then to 128 vector, and then finally to the two vector that is our estimated error. Uh, so note that it's not uh, an absolute value. It's predicting an error from our current location to the estimated landmark location. So what you would hope is as this thing iterates, um, that error is going to get smaller and smaller until it sort of becomes a fixed point where you sort of says, I'm here, uh, and it just predicts 0, 0 as, the, as the, the current offset to the landmark location. Also note again, there's no backpropagation through time. We just apply the same process over and over again and we do backpropagation on each iteration. So for training, we train one network for each landmark uh, and, and we're taking the initial estimate for where the uh, network is uh, looking from a normal distribution centered on the uh, training set landmark locations. Oh, and also we train the network with Adam. In terms of results, it seems to work really well. Uh, we're state of the art in all measurements and we are very close to the inter-observer variability in most cases. Okay, and uh, thanks everyone. And uh, I look forward to taking your questions.